All right, so welcome to algebraic topology. Uh, this is a course in algebraic topology, a beginner's course here at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. I am Norman Wildberger, and uh, the course is designed for third and fourth year math students. I hope to post these videos on, first of all, my site at YouTube, which is site uh, user NJ Wildberger, and it will also be posted at UNSW's site called UNSW eLearning. Algebraic topology is a very interesting and uh, beautiful subject, which developed from 19th century work in complex function theory, due to Riemann primarily, and then taken up by Henri Poincaré, great French mathematician of the turn of the century. And he established a lot of the foundational uh, ideas and further directions for the subject. And uh, a sense of the vibrancy of the subject is in the fact that just last uh, few years, one of the main open problems in this subject, which is also cons being considered one of the main open problems all of mathematics, was solved. And it was called Poincaré's conjecture. It was solved by a, a rather uh, unorthodox and highly original Russian mathematician, you may have heard about that. So we're, we're, that's part of the story that, uh, that eventually we'll make some contact with. Algebraic topology is roughly the study of shapes. Um, shapes where we are interested in what is maintained when we continuously deform shapes. And it's got natural connections with differential geometry and with algebraic geometry and with modern physics. It's very important for modern physics. So this course uh, is, is going to be talking about or touching base with a number of topics and I've listed them here. So let's just uh, quickly uh, give you an idea of where we're, we're going to be going. So we're going to talk about curves, winding numbers and curvature. And uh, one of the novelties of this presentation will be um, curvature. We're going to have a sort of a new way of thinking or somewhat new way of thinking about curvature in a very rational way. So that's going to be a, one of the novelties of this course. Another novelty is when we get to a very standard aspect, the classification of surfaces, we're going to use John Conway's zip proof, which is, I don't think it's found in, in any of the texts on the subject, or maybe some recent texts have it, um, but it's a, a very pleasant um, and insightful proof. We'll talk a little bit about knots and links and invariants of, of those. There are many invariants, but we'll just treat some simple ones. Then we're going to go back to a subject which is much earlier uh, historically, the uh, polyhedra, the uh, Euler number, and vector fields. We're going to make uh, some contact with graph theory, the topological aspects of graph theory, and talk about trees. We're going to talk about the fundamental group of a surface or a topological space, which was introduced by Poincaré. And then we'll eventually get to talking about three-dimensional manifolds. We'll take the step up from two-dimensional surfaces to three-dimensional manifolds, which is uh, much harder. Okay? But we're going to have a good look at the most fundamental uh, three-dimensional manifold, which is the three-sphere. It's a very rich object of study and naturally connected with quaternions. And then we're going to uh, also hopefully talk a little bit about homology and applications. So some of these words will not mean anything to you. That's all right. Okay. But uh, at the end of the course, uh, you should know what most of these words mean. Now, it's algebraic topology. So that means that algebra is used to study topology. We're interested in shapes. And a very common kind of shape is a donut, donut shape. And this may not look exactly like a donut. If, if this was served to you at Dunkin' Donuts, you'd probably be a little bit suspicious. But in topology, we're allowed to deform objects. And as long as we deform them continuously, we agree that they are the same. So this is a, a donut. Or the mathematical word is uh, a torus. 
And from the topological point of view, it doesn't matter if we bend it, distort it, twist it. One of the uh, ideas then is, although we're studying something which is very physical and spatial, and we can make models of, of these things, we're going to be studying them from an algebraic point of view often. Okay? And the algebra that we're going to use is a branch of algebra primarily called uh, group theory. Okay, so let me just uh, ask you, how many of you have, have taken group theory before? How many of you have not, not taken group theory? Okay, so okay, so we are going to use some group theory, but I am going to remind you and develop uh, more or less the essentials of the group theory that we need. But nevertheless, it's a good idea for you, if you are not familiar with group theory, to brush up on that subject. That's going to be our main algebraic tool to study topology. All right, so let's, let's say, what, what is algebraic topology? It's a natural question. And I guess a, a first answer might be that it's the study of of shapes. The study of shapes um, and their properties which are independent of continuous deformation. So for example, if we took this two-dimensional donut, and when we think of this uh, surface, we're thinking of it as a two-dimensional object, Okay. That means we're thinking of its skin as being the object of study. It's not the interior that counts, it's only the surface itself. And we can think of the surface as almost being made out of plastic. Okay. And you're allowed to deform it, and uh, one thing that you're allowed to deform it into is uh, okay, a, a coffee cup or mug. And it's like a kind of a standard way of thinking to, uh, to be able to see that the donut or the torus is really the same, if you allow continuous deformation, to a coffee mug. Can you see that? I mean, this thing here is uh, like, a, like the handle. And uh, if I sort of punched my hole through, through the if I punched my hand into the, the rest of it, I would get an indentation. And if I made that indentation sort of the shape of a cup and moved the handle around, then I would get a coffee cup. So the surface of a coffee cup or mug is, we say, homeomorphic. They're obviously not the same geometrically, but as far as topology is concerned, they're the same. So these things are considered the same, and that's our notion of sameness. It's called homeomorphism. These are homeomorphic objects. So this is not geometry. We're not interested in distance. We're not interested in making measurements exactly. We're interested in, in asking about what are the essential features of some mathematical objects which are invariant under this kind of uh, continuous deformation. And one of the, so one of the really uh, important benefits of this course, okay, is that yes, we're going to learn some algebraic topology and we're going to learn some particular techniques and concepts. But probably more important is that you're going to become familiar with a lot of really fundamental mathematical objects. We're going to have a good look at some 
objects which are really central in mathematics. Because they're the ones that are the most interesting and they're the ones that people have looked at the most. And so that's probably almost, for a student's perspective, the most important thing that you might get out of this. You're going to learn about fundamental objects. Such as what? Well, a, a torus is a, is a kind of a fundamental object, as we'll see. It may seem rather arbitrary now, but you'll see that it's quite a fundamental object. So let me ask you a question. If we had to, if we had to choose what are the most fundamental mathematical objects, of all the mathematical objects in the whole mathematical universe, what are the most fundamental mathematical objects, what would our answer be? Well, there's, there's lots of different possibilities. Um, maybe it sort of depends on what you consider important or what you consider fundamental. But certainly, uh, we would want something that's historically important, that's been studied for a long time, uh, something that has, that has a very rich theory. And uh, so what would your guess be? A sphere. A sphere. Anybody agree? I think a sphere would be uh, certainly a candidate. I've, in fact, brought what I think are the two most um, important historically uh, and uh, interest-wise, the two most important mathematical objects. I brought them along today. And one of them is a sphere. It's maybe not such an impressive sphere, but okay. <laughs> so that's, that's a sphere. And you're all familiar with the sphere. And you're, you're all familiar with uh, at least some of its geometrical properties. Okay? But of course, uh, that's also a sphere now in, in topology. It wasn't, it's not a sphere in geometry, but that's also a sphere in topology. So all those beautiful properties of the sphere that depend on the geometry are not going to be that much of interest to us. But nevertheless, that's certainly one of the most important mathematical objects. And I've got a second one in here. What's the, what's the other one? No, not so interesting. Yes, it's, it's important, of course, but it's not, it doesn't get the heart racing like a sphere. You know, a sphere is kind of exciting. A parabola, parabola is a good choice, but uh, something more, I think, I think ultimately more historically interesting. Yes, a torus, that's also a good choice, uh, but I think, I, I think uh, what I've got in the bag beats a torus. A Mobius band, another good choice, but it was only developed in the late 19th century, or middle 19th century, so it's historically doesn't have such a a right for this high, high elevation. Oh, oh, drum roll, and I'll show it. Yeah, it is right there. Do you know what it is? It's a dodecahedron. A dodecahedron. Isn't that the same as a sphere? Topologically, yep. it is. It is the same as a sphere. But that's only uh, an idea that's about 100 or 150 years old. Um, and only if you're in an algebraic topology class. If you're in a, a combinatorics class or a, a differential geometry class, it's quite different. Now, I hope you all know that this is one of the five platonic solids. Right? There are actually five of these things. And they were of paramount interest to the ancient Greeks. Euclid. I remind you, wrote the book, The Elements, and it's got 13 volumes, and it's a presentation of all of geometry that the ancient Greeks knew, and the culmination of Euclid's uh, work is, in the 13th book, is a study of the platonic solids. It's the high point as far as Euclid was concerned. And this particular one is historically the most important of, the, of all the platonic solids. I don't have all of them with me today, but I do have another one, which is also quite interesting. You, what's this one called? The icosahedron. Ico, icosa, I think, refers to 20. This has 20 faces. They're all triangles. Dodeca comes from the Greek. Um, dodeca means 12. It's uh, got 12 faces. This one's got 20 vertices. This one's got 
20 ver 12 vertices. These are dual in a, in a very precise sense, in the sense that if you take the centers of the faces here, uh, well, you get 12 uh, vertices, which are forming an icosahedron. And conversely, if you take the uh, centers of the faces here, uh, then you get um, 20 uh, points, which form a dodecahedron. So they're uh, dual. So why then have people historically considered uh, the dodecahedron to be uh, somewhat uh, most important? It's because this one is a little bit rounder. If you had to play soccer with one of these two things, uh, you would be best off choosing this one. Well, you can try it, not with these, because it, you, they wouldn't last very long under a rigorous FIFA conditions. But if there was actually a ball made of like these, you would much prefer to play with this one. It's rounder. And we're going to talk about, about that when we talk about curvature. How does one assess roundness? But in algebraic topology, uh, okay, let's put this one away as a secondary object. So here are the, here are my, here's my candidates for the two most important historical uh, objects. And I think it's hard to choose between them. They're both really interesting. If you're an, if you're an analyst or um, a geometer, well, perhaps this is more important or interesting. If you're a, an algebraically minded person or combinatorially minded, you much prefer this one. Uh, and in some sense, this is a continuous approximation of that one, and this is a discrete uh, approximation of this one. Okay. And the interplay between these two things is uh, something that's going to be uh, important to us. All right, so there's uh, lots of other uh, interesting uh, things that we're going to be talking about. And topologists like to argue physically. Okay. Uh, topology is a subject which is often a little bit dubious uh, logically. Um, I have to say that to be quite honest because many of you know that I'm a bit fussy about mathematical foundations. Um, and, and there will be many times in this course where we have to argue by pictures. Okay. The nature of the subject is different from any other subject you've done in mathematics. We'll argue with pictures, we'll argue with intuition, by analogy, by making a model and saying, look, Okay, and we're, so we're going to have an, uh, sort of an, almost an engineering or, or applied mathematics point of view on things. And when it comes to actually laying the foundations, that's a little bit uh, challenging sometimes. So I'm going to give you uh, uh, some problems to, to think about. Uh, these are all sort of standard problems, but they're good to, uh, to get started. Um, so, um, so problem number one concerns this uh, object right here. Okay, can you see that? Does it look interesting? Okay, it, it, it's got a flap. Okay, it just flaps there. There's nothing hidden about it. And I made it out of a single piece of paper without any glue or... I just made some cuts and, and made this. So the first problem is how, how, did, how do you make such a thing? Okay. So, uh, maybe I'll put it over here. Okay, so that's problem number one. <laughs> problem one. How to make... Okay, now I have to draw this thing. <laughs> well, I've already, so the video camera's already got it, but I have to draw it anyway. Okay, so this might be a little bit challenging. So there's roughly... Uh, got something like that, okay. So there's a sort of a piece that goes up like this, and then there's this fold. Uh, maybe the fold will be like that. And then there's a piece that goes like this. And then the other piece uh, all carries on like this. Okay, so this, this is the fold here. Does that look like it? Can you explain the fold? Yeah, okay, so, so, so there's, there's a fold here, and there's a kind of a fold on, on this side. So that, that part comes up to that fold, 
and that part comes up to that fold. So okay, behind here, there's there's something. Okay. How to make this with a single paper and no glue. All right, so there's, there's problem number one. And here's problem number two. Okay, this, this goes back to a famous uh, 19th century puzzle maker named Sam Lloyd, who also created lots of uh, chess puzzles and other things. So what you do is you have, the ingredients are you need a shirt, with uh, lots of um, buttons and holes for the buttons. Okay, and you also need a pencil. Well, it doesn't have to be that big, but okay, it's a large, in large view. There's a pencil, and from the pencil you have a loop. You, on a, you've got a, a piece of string, which is looped like this. So this is a pencil with a loop. And the loop is not big enough to go over the pencil. Okay, even if you pull it tight, it's not big enough to go over the pencil. So with a loop which is uh, smaller than the pencil. Okay, and so these are the ingredients and then what we do is, um, if you know how to do it, what you do is you take the shirt, and you can actually do it on, with somebody's shirt. If you have one of these things, you can do it. You say, what? look the other way for a second, and you do something quickly. And then uh, afterwards, this is before, and then after, you end up with something that like, looks like this. Okay, um, okay so here's our, our shirt. there. Okay, so we've taken one of the holes and um, what happens? Um, maybe I'll call this pencil yellow. Okay, so the pencil is now um, like this. And uh, what about the the loop, uh, maybe it'll be purple. There's our, our purple loop. The loop looks like this. Now it goes through here. Then it comes out the back. And uh, Goes under. So it only uses one hole of the shirt. Yeah, it just uses one hole of the shirt. Okay, so um, so so the pencil is now attached to the shirt, but uh, this part goes over. Let me, let me try to make that a little bit more clear. So there's that there. Uh, that goes into the hole, and then outside here. Uh, oh yeah, we need to preserve holes. This is topology. Yeah, right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, so is, is, that, is that double piece of string everywhere? Huh? 
This is a solid piece of string. This is a solid piece of string. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll draw it. I'll just make it a little bit thicker. I, I want to make it clear that this is in front, and that's behind. So, 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 so it's all. So the thing come, goes in the hole, and then comes out. So sort of dot, dot, dot through there. And it comes out the uh, the back. If if this was on top, then we could just pull the pencil out, yeah. right? But it's it's looped under, so now the pencil is stuck. Yeah. Do you agree? The pencil is stuck, uh, and so the question is, how, explain how to, how this trick is done. You can also always make a model and. Uh, Try it out. It actually works once you figure out how to do it. Okay, and problem number three. This is a well-known uh, puzzle that you can find in many places. Okay, so um, we have a piece of wood. It's like a, a thin little piece of wood. And it's got a hole in the middle. And, okay, uh, it's a, it's a lot like uh, that. There's uh, some string, and the string comes up and uh, through there. And there's another piece that goes up and through there. It goes through the hole and comes out the other side. And it wraps then around. Okay, an advantage that I have with chalk is that it's easy to rub things off. Um, it's just the nature of this topology. Okay, so now that you, you can see that there's a, yeah, that it's a lot like the shape over there. There's a string attached to this uh, thing. And what we have also is we have two uh, balls, which are hollow, on, on each of these, um, on each of these strings. And the balls are, um, big enough to not fit through this hole. And the aim is to manipulate things to bring the balls together. In other words, we want the other ball over on this side as well. Have you seen that puzzle? You may have, maybe even have it at home. Topologists love this kind of thing. This is great. They, they love to play with this kind of physical thing, try to imagine how do we do it. And part of, part of learning about this is to develop a bit of physical intuition so that we're not afraid of thinking about something like this and manipulating in our minds. All right, I'd better put a square around that, so that's another problem to do. All right, so in our next lecture, we're going to uh, start with the course proper. This is sort of in, an introduction. We're going to start with the simplest kind of algebraic topology, which is one-dimensional algebraic topology. See you then. <laughs>